production or prediction, healthy risk-taking or dangerous betting? What are the implications of a society based along the lines of Wall Street? This week, author Ivan Asher and strike debt activist Pam Brown join me, and we hear from Mandy Cabot on why she turned down a $100 million buyout deal for her company, Dance Go Shoes. It's all coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. When Marx looked out at what produced profit in his day, he saw grinding factories producing things. If he'd gone back further, he might have been struck most by agriculture. Today, what dominates is Wall Street, finance. And not just investing and trading, but betting. That is, risk and credit. We call it playing the market, but it's not really playing when you're gambling with people's needs, like college and housing and pensions. We discovered that in 2008 when the market crashed. We have gone from a production-based economy to a prediction-based one, and it's affecting every aspect of our lives, says today's guest. Ivan Asher is the author of a new book called Portfolio Society, which looks at the 21st century risk-based economy. Joining him is Pam Brown, returning guest, writer and organizer with Rolling Jubilee that was born out of Occupy Student Debt. She's also a host on WBAI Radio. Welcome both. Glad to have you. So, obvious question, what is the Portfolio Society, Ivan? Uh, well, it's a, it's a phrase I, I actually borrow or lift from someone else, uh, Gerald Davis, who's a sociologist at Michigan, who uh, uses it to describe basically societies, capitalist societies, that are dominated by finance. And is that new? I mean, there's always been markets, or there have been for years? Well, that part is not new. Uh, what I think is new is uh, the, the, the fact that it's taken such a place, uh, it's a kind of a dominant place in, in organizing our lives, uh, and also as a, as a source or site of, of profit making. Um, but not just profit making, as you said, it's a disproportionate amount of, of money now it gets made by, uh, in, in the financial world, but it also just governs our, our relations or shapes our relations in ways that it didn't before. Well, I'd love you to elaborate a little bit on that. In what ways does being a risk and credit-based society affect our relations with one another? In the 19th century, in the kind of industrial era, people spoke of a bourgeois society or civil society. And so the portfolio society, I understand to be the kind of contemporary version of this. We're still organized around exchange and production, mm -hmm. but on top of this, we have these financial markets that increasingly encroach or, or shape the way in which we do govern or do produce and, 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 and buy and sell things. So, you know, a simple example would be the use of credit cards. Uh, when you go to the market, uh, you don't, no longer use cash, but certainly if you buy anything online, your, your, your uh, transaction is mediated by, by credit cards, which means all kinds of things in the way that people have access to markets uh, and, and the way in which we have to produce ourselves as a certain kind of subject, somebody who is credit worthy somebody who's, whose probability of default can be measured and so forth. This gets some of the work that you do and have done o over years, Pam. When you hear about a kind of credit relation-based <laughs> society, mm -hmm. what bells go off in your head? Well, I was just thinking about sort of the transition that happened earlier in the 1900s, really in around 1934, with the Housing Act that did create kind of a debtor society. Awesome. Because prior to that, when people bought property, uh, the uh, terms of mortgage were very, very different. It was only in 1934 that you started to have longer mortgage terms, and that allowed people to buy, in a sense, more property. There were lots of problems. I don't want to um, state that there weren't before that, of course, but that was a real turning point for the way that debt was conceived. A point was that that was a, a that was a point literally where the banks and the government became partners because prior to that there wasn't a, an explicit relationship at least between the banks and the government in terms of insuring people's debt, taking it off of the books. Banks didn't want to lend to people because they would subsume all of the risk, mm -hmm. right? They would assume all the risk. And so once the government stepped in and said, "Well, we want people buying houses and we want to create." 
this kind of particular kind of subject because at the time people were thinking along the lines of communism. They were not that excited by capitalism. They were coming out of the depression and people were pretty um, embittered. So giving them this opportunity and that really fostered and set this whole process that you're talking about into very clear motion. And that's when we saw Freddie Mae and Fannie Mac, all exactly. of those. But the idea was to make home ownership more accessible well, to more people. That actually, was bad. really the idea was to give people jobs because to create an industry around construction, which is really fascinating. So it was always debt and labor were always really, really connected. And then cut to, you know, student debt, which is where I started thinking about this. And you had the creation of Sally Mae in about 1968 with um, the um, Education Act, right? And so that mirrors the Housing Act. That was how I kind of ended up seeing that there was a relationship between the two. So it was very, it was very clear that the result of Sally Mae encouraging student debt would be rising cost of college, increased debt, a totally different subject right someone who's thinking all the time about what they owe to banks right not what they owe to other people in our society what they owe to these financial you know corporations and that has and the labor piece of this equation is almost totally dropped out is that fair to say Ivan yes and no it is sadly dropped out of my analysis but it hasn't dropped out of, of the overall mm -hmm. picture right so there are there's still labor involved um, people are still working uh, but the things that you mentioned earlier, the, the, the products are, are, are largely made beyond what is traditionally American capitalism. So a lot of the, the, what we used to think of as labor no longer um, is visible to the eye. So it's not that it, it drops out, but it's, it is kind of displaced as a central category of financial economics by these measures of risk and so forth. And in, and in that place, at least to go by your book, it's that prediction piece comes in. Uh, instead of the productive economy, the predictive economy, as you write, kind of has predictions, hedging, and so on, where production once was. Right, or at least, uh, yes, so uh, I, I speak of prediction, uh, you know, obviously partly a pun on this capitalist mode of production, uh, but there's also protection, right? So finance uh, is, a, is a way for people to, to protect themselves uh, against adverse effects or, or to take risks. Uh, but it's a kind of risk that not everybody bears uh, in the same ways, or certain people are taking risks and other people uh, are at risk in a sense. So uh, it's, yes, uh, production isn't eclipsed entirely, but it's now mediated by these various forms of calculations, like what are the odds that this, uh, you know, that the, the currency will fluctuate in this way or that. So how are class relations changed? I mean, to use a good Marxist phrase, it used to have workers and bosses or, you know, um, peasants and feudal lords, uh, what do we have now? Metaphorically, I would say there are the people who are in a position to, to bet on the outcome of a race, and then there are people who have to run the race. So, so the, uh, that's one way of putting it. I mean, other people, you know, other people speak of a casino capitalism, which is not a bad analogy, in the sense that you know, everybody's gambling or betting, but there's really also a house. But the, the, the way that neither metaphor really works in the sense that one of the things that's so pernicious about contemporary financialization is that as people make bets on other people's chances that they will, say, make good on their payments, they're also affecting the chances that these people will make good on their payments. Right? So, the, mm. so there's a kind of a recursive or kind of a dynamic that, that you know, if, if, I, if, if financial markets think that you're going to default you're going to be given ter terms uh, that, that will lead to your And that's thing. where racism, sexism, exactly. homo, right. everything, mm -hmm. phobias so of every kind. So the things that you mentioned earlier, like the 30s were one generation, and you know, to the extent that we've tried to move past certain uh, of the practices of segregation at the time, they're still lingering there, uh, even though they not, may not be mm -hmm. easily grasped. Mm -hmm. Just an example of this, actually, is that um, credit is also given based on where you live. So if you live near a um, payday loan place, mm -hmm. believe it or not, just because of where you live, if you have equal credit to someone who does not live, you did all the exact same things, you will have probably about $7,000 less access to credit. So the amount of credit that you have, in impacts your credit score, obviously. Because they assume right? people living near a payday loan place are low-income people in the neighborhood is somehow less worth lending in? 
It's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like good old fashioned redlining. Yeah. It amounts to that because of course, if you live in a, in a minority neighborhood where there are more of those places, regardless of anything that you could personally do, regardless of your job situation, you know, your quote unquote credit worthiness, which is a bizarre concept anyway, right? You're still subject to their evaluation. I mean, it is true that now on job applications, even for standard things like, I don't know, parking lot attendant, they ask you your, cat, your credit risk, your credit right, score. Right. It's true that I think I mean, it, 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 it has come to take a play an inordinately large role. Uh, but you're saying, yeah, it, it is, it is, it's like redlining, except it's not quite the same thing, right? It's like it's it's under the radar, in a right? Sense. It's a colorblind kind of formulation, I think, of what you know was explicit redlining in the past, and we still haven't addressed, of course, the impact of not, we're not going back to, you know, the 1800s or the 1700s here. We only need to look to the 1950s, right? Which is not, it's one generation. I mean, my dad was born in 1926. So it's really one generation to see the impact of this, right? Because if you couldn't obtain property, even if you had a middle class job, because of your certain race, then obviously you can't, you don't have the, the wealth. And we have a 21 to one ratio, wealth ratio between black and white in this country as a direct result of both the history and also this process that you're identifying, which is this increased financialization, the increased reliance on money to make money, right? Money begets money, and that separation is really, really growing. Ivan, coming back to you, um, you start by quoting Steinbeck and Grapes of Wrath, you know, that men made it, but men can't control it. Uh, he meant men and mm. women, too, I'm thinking. Um, who <laughs> controls this, and how do we change it if you think it should be changed? I certainly think it should be changed. Uh, who controls it uh, is a tougher question, or how do we change it is a tougher question. Um, yeah, the, the Steinbeck quote um, refers to the, you know, these banks as monsters. Uh, so uh, one of the things that I think that, the, and the, we speak of, of Wall Street or finance in, in monstrous terms, right? In the 19th century, people spoke of vampires. Now we speak of zombies. And I think that attests to the the difficulty of exactly identifying the agency and also the way in which we are somehow in, implicated in the creation of this beast. Um, how can it be changed uh, or what is to be done? I mean, uh, that's, you know. What is it subprime borrowers of the world unite or something? Not everybody is equally affected or implicated in these ways, right? So uh, we're all borrowers in, 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 a, in a fashion, but it plays out differently depending on whether you're male or female, white or black and so forth. Uh, where you live. And so I think it's important for us to attend to the ways in which uh, finance does shape everybody's lives, mm -hmm. but it affects our, or shapes our lives differentially. So for instance, you mentioned where you live, your zip code and so forth. So I, you know, I live in an affluent neighborhood, like suburb of Milwaukee, so Milwaukee being an exceedingly segregated city. So by dint of where I live, in a sense, I am complicit in, in rendering somebody else's credit score uh, lower, right? Because I, you know, whatever I do, my neighbors are, are mm. propping me up. Um, and, and so, and, you know, what do I do with this knowledge? I don't exactly know, but whatever it is that we are going to do, we're going to be attentive to the ways in which we're doing these things. So I guess instead of like what is to be done, my concern right now is like what is it we're doing mm. that we might then, when the time mm. comes for an opening, rewrite the rules. If we are looking at a global phenomenon, which you're very clear, this is global and increasingly so, is there a global solution to any of this, given that so much of what you're talking about has to do with non-concrete phenomena, the, the economy that is based on global markets and global trading? Any answer to that? We live in a globalized world, like it or not, but things again play out differently dif where, depending on where you are. So I think you know we need to be attentive to the politics of, of uh, financialization, be it in the European Union or in the U.S. or in Haiti and so forth. And no, I don't imagine there would be a global solution, but maybe uh, uh, we need to acknowledge that the politics of the economy. Basically, I, I, I'm not an economist. Perhaps this is my you know parochialism, but I don't think the, that economists should have uh, the, the claim over, over, over the discourse. Right? So it's, it's more about the, the politics of markets. And, and once we recognize that markets are made and that they're relations of power, um, 
so we have a better chance of, at, at actually, if, if not seizing control, at least uh, acting in a manner that is coherent. Final thought from you, Pam? Hmm. I guess thinking about this aspect of power and what people can really do, I think part of the role right now of activists and uh, people in the media is to really uh, expose what's happening so that people can think about it, writers like you. Um, because without that knowledge, we can't really do anything. We may not really be ready yet to make the next move. I think that uh, one of the possibilities, though, we did see with Occupy Wall Street that these ideas did really come into the public in a whole new way. People weren't really talking about student debt that much, and now you hear about it constantly, and I think that was really powerful. And maybe that a new space needs to open up that people can come together and actually think together and be together in person, physically, um, about what a new system would look like. How would we start, you know, to uproot some of the deep, deep problems that we have? But I don't know without it, if without that kind of personal interaction, if we can have that. Sounds like an argument for more thought experiments and then more actual talking about them. Portfolio Society on the Capitalist Mode of Prediction is out now from Ivan Asher. Thank you so much, both of you, for being on the program. Thank, Thank you, Laura. And if you want to find out more about rolling jubilee or student strike debt, you can see my earlier interviews with Pam Brown at our website. That is lauraflanders.com. Thanks. A silver tsunami is coming. Have you heard of it? As baby boomer business owners approach the age to retire, tens of thousands of CEOs are wondering what to do with their businesses. Selling off to a bigger firm might not be possible or might not conform to their values, so what else to do? Mandy Cabot, founder and CEO of Dansko Shoes, faced that choice a few years back and made a very different decision. I had a chance to talk with her and Richard Eidlin, co-founder of the American Society Sustainable Business Council earlier this year at the Progressive Congress Summit in Baltimore. Welcome to the program, both of you. It's a pleasure to have yeah, you with us. Thanks, Laura. Thank um, just remind us, Richard, the Sustainable Business Council's been around how long? Who do you represent and why? Yeah, so we started in July of 2009. It's a national business advocacy group based in D.C., and we represent over 200,000 companies across the U.S., and um, those companies tend to be what we would call high road or triple bottom line companies. And the premise for starting the council was that those types of companies that are making money, that are treating their employees well, investing in their communities, concerned with the environment, historically they hadn't been well represented in the policy process, either in D.C. or at state capitals. And now? And now we're able to represent those companies across the uh, country both on Capitol Hill and in state legislatures across the country. And Mandy, coming to you, did I, did I summarize more or less accurately your situation? It's quite a story. You did. Um, we were the quintessential mom and pop. We started our business, we, my husband and I, in 1990, after discovering in my husband's native Denmark what we instantly recognized as the world's most comfortable shoe. Of course. And our first business plan went something like this. If you've got something great to share, you share it. And if in the sharing you can reinvest in more to share, you do that too, and the gift just keeps on giving. So that was the premise. And you did brilliantly, and I think at the last I looked, you had uh, annual revenues of something like 120 million, something like that? We did. We've been between 125 and 150. Um, we started with an initial investment of $7,500, um, proceeds from the sale of a young horse. My husband and I were horse trainers. And we kept sharing this incredible find, um, magnets of serendipity that we, that we are, and uh, very consumer driven. And we evolved and came up with new designs and new programs and, and expanded from the $7,500 investment to a high watermark of 150 million with uh, 150 employees. Most people, when they get an offer for their company from an enormous competitor, Timberland, a hundred million dollar offer would have said it yes. It was a little north of that, but I didn't want, it wasn't public information, so I... All right. I, I low-balled it a bit. So but tell me how, what, what, how that played out. What happened? Well, 
the hundred million is important in one regard, not to tie it to the offer, but because we had reached that magical, mythical level at which entrepreneurs are said to start failing. And I bought it. I bought that hook, line, and sinker. And I had a crisis of confidence, frankly, that I could take the, com the company um, to the next level. We were truly the quintessential mom and pop. We homeschooled our, our staff. We homeschooled our baby Dansko. Um, we followed her through toddlerhood into school age, into revolutionary teenager, into adulthood, and realized that we really were going to need some outside help. And this prospective purchaser had the same values we had. They had financial modeling that we could only imagine. They had international sales and distribution and R&D, all of those things. And we thought that their public commitment to doing well by doing good was a perfect match for us. Sounds good. Um, what happened? What really got me was this nagging concern that I was selling my baby down the river because I didn't know how to raise her. And how lame was that? Mm -hmm. I was going to need to pull on my big girl pants and be a CEO and surround myself with folks that really knew what they were doing. And the fact that we were not willing to sell out, but that we wanted to keep jobs local, that we wanted to keep our culture uh, intact, that we wanted to keep our North Star, um, protect our family, that was very appealing for a lot of folks who had had experience in our industry in much larger, frequently public corporations. So what you decided to do in the end was to sell how much of your company to the workers? 100%. We made that transaction all in one fell swoop. How significant is this story? It's increasingly uh, common and there's a trend across the economy where owners of companies and founders are looking to democratize the workplace. And so when the American Sustainable Business Council hears these types of stories, we like to hold them up and really suggest that this is what success looks like in the American economy. And that companies can be financially successful, also really committed to the workforce, provide great benefits, uh, commit to environmental stewardship, and there's nothing inconsistent about that. And that's actually what successful capitalism looks like in the 21st century. Elaborate a little on how it helps combat poverty and income inequality. Well, I'll say something, and then Mandy, I'm sure, will have a thought as well. But um, the fact that many workers don't have adequate earnings, um, nor do they have a retirement plan uh, because their company hasn't set one up, is a real barrier to people's financial success and their being able to get, you know, move from uh, lower income to middle income. So ESOPs are able to set, you know, they, they create a pathway for people to have a future retirement plan. Um, and that workers who are given, as in Mandy's case, you know, an opportunity to own a part of the company, all of a sudden can launch themselves into a much better financial place in the future. Sure. And that helps to reduce the, the you know, income gap. At the end of the day, employees are the lifeblood of our business. They are our business. They solve problems. They answer the phone. They design product. They're innovative. They're creative. They're, they are truly now invested. They are the investors in our business. What is the significance of your story, and how do you see this sort of new economic model um, affecting our political scenario, our political scene? Mandy, Richard? It's important in this moment where we're having this conversation about restructuring the economy and some of the priorities that the Trump administration and, and a GOP-controlled Congress have to look at these types of stories because we're quite convinced that the path that the Republican Congress and the Trump administration is heading down is not going to benefit the middle class, it's not going to raise boats, and that their definition of success is inconsistent with environmental stewardship, with equality, really with opportunity and that the work of progressive, responsible businesses is really the trajectory of the American economy. So there are, it's a hard road ahead, but our goal is really to present to legislators and to the media these types of stories and say, hey, 
this is what success looks like in the future. You can be part of it. Thank you both. Mandy Cabot, Richard Idle, really, real honor to be with you. Good. Thanks, Thanks for coming Laura. on the program. Thank you very much. You're watching The Laura Flanders Show. Mm -hmm.